the purpose of Jesus' miracles. In our presentation, we'd like to address the following questions along with some key points. One, where would Jesus know where he was to live during the three and a half years of ministry? Two, what would a list of miracles reveal to us in regards to the travel patterns of our Lord? Three, what effect would the Passover have on our Lord's travel plans? Four, why did Jesus perform eight miracles on the Sabbath day? Five, why do the scriptures state that Jesus was the Lord of the Sabbath? Six, why was the transfiguration seen so important to our Lord and to the church? Seven, who said, Lord, it is good for us to be here. Where and when was this said? Eight, explain the deposit of Christ's blood at Calvary to the mercy seat. Nine, the splitting of the veil in the temple when God's justice receives the blood of Christ. Our talk will be divided into three main parts. One would be miracles, two would be deposit, and three would be the veil. Before we consider miracles, we'd like to discuss where Jesus would live. In Isaiah chapter 9, verses 1 and 2, we read, When Jesus was in the wilderness, he studied the scriptures which were open to him. From Isaiah chapter 9, verse 1 and 2, we see that Jesus would learn where he would live. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 1. But there would be no more gloom for her who was in anguish. In earlier times, she treated the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali with contempt. But later on, he shall make it glorious by the way of the sea on the other side of Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 2. The people who walk in darkness will see a great light. Those who live in a dark land, the light shall shine on them. The fulfillment of this prophecy is in Matthew chapter 4, verses 12 to 16. Now, when he heard that John had taken into custody, was taken into custody, he withdrew into Galilee. And leaving Nazareth, he came and settled in Capernaum, which is by the sea in the region of Zebulun and Naphtali. This was to fulfill what was spoken through Isaiah the prophet, saying, The land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, by the way of the sea, beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people who were sitting in darkness saw a great light. And to those who were sitting in the land and shadow of death, upon them a light dawned. We start with our first segment, would be miracles. In Strong's number 4592, it's an indication or supernatural miracle, sign, token, or wonder. In Strong number 1411, dunamis, dynamite, miraculous power, ability, abundance, meaning, might, strength, violence, Mighty, wonderful work. Vine's Expository Dictionary would be dunamis. Power, inherent ability, is used of works of a supernatural origin and character, such as would not be produced by natural agents and means. Semillion, a sign, mark, token, to give a sign, a sema, is used of miracles and wonders as signs of divine authority. Wonder, teras, something strange causing the beholder to marvel, is always used in the plural, always rendered wonders and generally follows 
Samia signs. Continuing definition of miracles, <clears throat> in the Greek New Testament, the synoptic word for miracles is act of power, the origin of our English words dynamic and dynamite. In John's Gospel, he uses the word sign. The word wonder is found in the works of, of the apostles in the book of Acts. When Christianity was young, miracles worked in conjunction with a message to aid individuals to see that, Christ, that God was behind Christianity and had turned from the Jewish system of sacrifices. In time, miraculous gifts present in the first century would pass away. There was a necessity to pro provide proof for the transition from the Jewish age to the gospel age. The number of miracles. You will notice on this map that 26 miracles were performed in the north in the area of Capernaum and Bethsaida, and this would be the home of Jesus. One miracle was performed in Samaria, and eight miracles were performed when Jesus would travel to Jerusalem. If we were to have a circle with a diameter of about 25 miles, 26 of the 35 miracles that Jesus performed would be performed in the area of Capernaum. Miracles, the order, place, and results. One, the miracles of Jesus. The order, miracle, place would be recorded in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The place and the results, we'd have 26 miracles in the north, one miracle in Samaria, which would be the middle, and eight miracles in the south. Three, under the Gospel of John, Jesus made four trips to Jerusalem for the Passover. Three of the four trips were round trips to Jerusalem, and the last trip was when Jesus would die on the cross. The first Passover is recorded in John chapter 2, verse 13. The second Passover is recorded in John chapter 5, verse 1. The third Passover is recorded in John chapter 6, verse 4. And the last Passover was recorded in John chapter 13, verse 1. The summary of miracles. There are four basic type of miracles. One would be exorcism, which were six to free from the power of demons. Two would be healing, 17 miracles to free from diseases. Three would be nature, nine to use elements of nature. Four would be resuscitations, three temporary revival from the dead. If anyone could think of another category, we'd be glad to uh, add to the four uh, that we have. The summary of miracles. Jesus had power over nature. He turned water into wine, calmed the tempest, and walked on the sea. Jesus had power over demons. Demon-possessed person was healed. A demon-possessed who was both blind and dumb was healed. Jesus was able to heal. He healed Peter's wife. He, Jesus healed every sickness and every disease among the people. Jesus demonstrated his power over death. He raised Lazarus' daughter, the widow's son, and Lazarus from the dead. And we'd like to mention that these were resuscitation. And we would not want to use the word resurrection because Jesus did not provide the ransom. So the question before us is, why did Jesus perform his eight miracles on the Sabbath? We'd like to list the points that Jesus knew. 
Jesus knew from the Old Testament the following points about the Sabbath. One, pulling an ox out of a ditch on the Sabbath was permitted. Two, circumcision was performed on the Sabbath. Three, it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. Four, the precedent of David and his men eating the showbread. Five, priests work on the Sabbath and are blameless. Six, the ministry of the Messiah is greater than the ministry of the temple. Seven, God desires mercy from his people and not sacrifice. Seven, eight, the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. And we're going to talk about that as we move along. Nine, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. Ten, It is lawful to lead animals to water on the Sabbath. Eleven, the Father works on the Sabbath. Twelve, it is a picture of the millennial age. And we can be thankful that Jesus only broke the Pharisee rules and not the Sabbath. Reapers in in regards to healing on the Sabbath. In Reprint 2431, paragraph 1, we are not to consider that our Lord performed so many of his miracles on the Sabbath, apparently in preference to others' days, as signifying any disrespect to the day, nor as signifying a desire to provoke the Pharisees. Rather, we may suppose that the performance of the notable miracles on this day were was largely in order to thus point out the great seventh-day Sabbath, the millennial day, the 7,000-year period of Earth's history, when the antitypical and the far greater miracles and blessings will come to mankind. These things, miracles, did Jesus and manifested forth beforehand his coming glory. Continuing in reprint 3316, paragraph 4, God's laws are meant for blessings. The Sabbath was made for man, was made for the benefit of mankind, not men's physical, mental, and moral rest and recuperation and strengthening. The Pharisees view the day as though God specially desired to have the Sabbath day observed and had created man for that particular purpose. Evidently, they were in error, and our Lord had the proper conception of the law and the fulfillment of it accurately. In reprint 3311, paragraph 1, our Lord, however, seems to have preferred the Sabbath days for his healing work. At all events, some of his most notable miracles were done on the Sabbath days. His reason for so doing was not, we believe, to exasperate the Pharisees and the scribes or merely to show the hypocrisy of their formalism, but because the Sabbath day served a special purpose as an illustration of the great Sabbath that is to come, the millennium in which all the families of the earth shall be blessed by the good physician. In Reaper 37554, we read, And we believe this to be a very key point, Lord also of the Sabbath. But after convincing them from the scriptures that their position was untenable, our Lord asserted to them his authority as an interpreter of the law, saying, I say unto you, one greater than the temple is here. If it was right for the Levites to perform the temple services on the Sabbath, Jesus was greater than the temple in that he was the Son of God, the mouthpiece of God, and his disciples might therefore rest secure in anything done in his service and with his approval. And we have a key scripture that we'd like all the brethren to remember, and that would be Matthew 12, 8, this is a New American Standard, for the Son of Man is the Lord of the Sabbath. In the Gospel of John, 
Jesus had many illustrations of the many roles that he would play. I will not read the scriptures, as you could uh, see they're all from John. I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the door. I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the true vine. These are beautiful scriptures, but the only negative thing is that the Trinitarians have seized upon these scriptures because they like to relate those to Exodus chapter 3, verses 14 to 16, when God said, I am Jehovah, and he said, I am that I am. So the Trinitarians like to tie these scriptures together and use this as a proof that Jesus would be part of the Trinity. On our chart, you'll notice the Lord of the Sabbath, and time element would be a thousand years. So Jesus was very uh, encouraged by the fact that he knew that God would set aside a thousand years, and he would be the Lord of the Sabbath. We have seven signs of John, as we mentioned before, that miracles could be defined as signs. One was turning water into wine, and this was the beginning of his signs. Two, healing the nobleman's son. This is the second sign. Three would be hearing, healing the paralytic. Four would be feeding the multitude. And five would be walking on water. Six, sight to the man born blind. Seven, raising Lazarus resuscitation. The purpose of Jesus' miracles. One was not to remove all sickness from the world. Two would be to demonstrate his ability to forgive sin. And that was a sample in a tentative sense. Jesus said to the layman, to rise, your sins are forgiven. Three, prove that he was sent of God. Four, to fulfill prophecy. And five, to prove his identity as the Messiah. Now we'd like to consider the wedding at Canaan. We'd like to examine one of three miracles in details. In detail. The first miracle was changing water into fine wine. I'm not a chemist, but I'd like to relate that this is not an easy thing to do. Not to minimize that this is something very simple. And it was fine wine, too. (laughs) And Jesus took time to go to a wedding, and that would be, we would think in terms of the Garden of Eden. We might get the thought that Jesus would be so, uh, so involved in important mission that he would not want to go to the wedding. But uh, contrary to thinking uh, along that line, Jesus was very happy to go to a wedding. And three, Jesus loved people and to be with them. Four, he came to save people from the curse. Now I have a question for you. I don't know the answer. I have different possibilities. Jesus' mother asked him to address a bad situation. So the question I want you to think about, did Mary know that Jesus had miraculous powers? So you have something to think about. For the wedding of Canaan, Jesus demonstrated his power over nature. The disciples believed and they were impressed. Jesus turned water into the finest wine. He demonstrated that he was full of joy and happiness. And this was an illustration of the marriage of Jesus and the church. And the new wine would represent teachings, doctrines of the millennial age. Next, we'd like to consider the man born blind. Jesus healed a man who was born blind. This was the first time in the history of mankind that this was done. The Pharisees questioned the parents, and the parents replied to the Pharisees, go and ask him. 
and the Pharisees who can see don't accept Jesus. So the irony of point number three is that the Pharisees who could see don't accept Jesus. The man who is born blind accepts Jesus, and we believe that he would be involved in the high calling. And Jesus healed the blind man on the Sabbath. And this would fulfill part of the prophecies from the Old Testament from Isaiah 35, 5. Then the eyes of the blind would be opened, and the ears of the deaf will be unstopped. <clears throat> Next, we'd like to consider uh, Lazarus, and that would be a resuscitation. Jesus made a very unusual statement. He repeated it twice. In John chapter 11, verse 4 and 40, Jesus said that you will see the glory of God. And Peter was mildly reproved by Martha. He was mildly reproved by Mary. And Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. Jesus was deeply moved, and Jesus wept. And the thought of Jesus wept, two words, that's the shortest scripture in the Bible. Lazarus was dead for 44 days, and Jesus deliberately waited, and he wanted to illustrate what we would like to demonstrate, the glory of God. So in the resurrection, Jesus wanted to demonstrate very thoroughly because the two resuscitations could have been a revival from a deep coma. But Jesus wanted to make it very clear that whether a person was dead for four days, 40 years, 400 years, 4,000 years, he had the ability to raise someone from the dead. Many Jews... Uh, believed in Jesus after this great event. In Ezekiel 128, we are told that the glory of God is the rainbow. So how will we harmonize what Jesus said that you will see the glory of God? It was not raining when, when uh, Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. So we would like to suggest that Jesus was saying that he would be the antithetical high priest. And the glory robes of the high priest would contain all of the colors of the rainbow. I think you remember from your lesson in grammar school or high school that all of the colors of the rainbow are named after a man, Roy G. Biv. Roy would be red orange, uh, 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 yellow, and G would be green, and Biv would be blue, uh, indigo, and violet. And I'm sure you're familiar with all of the colors. So all the colors of the rainbow would be in the glory robes of the high priest plus uh, the 12 jewels of the breastplate. The transfiguration scene. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. Matthew chapter 17, verse 5. This was a picture of the kingdom. Jesus knew that he would be the Lord of the Sabbath, that God would assign a thousand years for him. And this was a picture of the Lord's second presence. And it was Peter who said, Lord, it is good for us to be here. And I'm sure everyone in this room would say, it is good for us to be here at this convention. Next, we have a throne scene, and this would be a green emerald halo around the throne. This is Revelation chapter 4, verse 3. This is an unusual rainbow because it only has one color. And the green would represent restitution. And you'll see that you have God sitting upon the throne. You have God's four attributes. You have the 24 elders. And then you have all of the angels singing, glory, glory, glory to God. 
because it was by his will that all things were created. Next, we'd like to cover deposit. God's great gift and miracle. The four uh, uh, scriptures that you hear are the same scripture as 2 Corinthians 9, 15. I think this is a very beautiful scripture, and I think each uh, translation brings out a different thought. The, <clears throat> the New American Standard and the NIV say, Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. The King James says, Thanks be unto God for his unspeakable gift. And the New English Bible says, Thanks be to God for his gift beyond words. I personally like the diaglot the best, where it says, Thanks to God for his inexpressible free gift. And we're going to illustrate That it was a free gift, but Jesus had to die in order to make it a free gift. The deposit of Christ's blood. We have a beautiful scripture in Romans 3.25, whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in his blood through faith. The diaglot in both columns uses mercy seat instead of propitiation. I'd like to emphasize the fact that God displayed this publicly. You can see crosses on churches. You can see crosses in hospitals. So the whole world recognizes that Jesus died for mankind. But unfortunately, they do not understand the ransom. The deposit of Christ's blood. When Christ died on the cross... His blood went directly to the mercy seat. I have to admit for myself that I did not have the right thought for many years, so I would hope to present what I feel is the correct thought. The deposit of Christ's blood. The mercy seat or covering of the Ark of the Covenant was the place of making satisfaction, the the propitiatory, But the priest in sprinkling the blood of the atonement, the blood of the sin offering on the helisterion, accomplished halasmos. That is, he made satisfaction or propitiation for the sins of the people. And this is covered in the studies in the scriptures, volume 5, page 4423, and that would be the footnote. So we'd like to examine what Pastor Russell said concerning the ransom disposed by of by Jesus. The question 1916, what did Jesus do with the ransom price when he ascended into heaven? The answer, he had already placed it in the hands of justice as a deposit. The human life right, the price, still was in his command. His next step was to embargo or mortgage it by imputing a share of it to his church yet undeveloped. This would be page 569. Question number 16. Was the ransom paid at Calvary? Answer. We have already covered this point, showing that the ransom was laid down at Calvary and later placed in the hands of justice but not paid over in the sense of completing the contract, that being reserved for a future time. The ransom was laid down at the cross when Jesus said, Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit, my life. Thus Jesus, so to speak, made a deposit of the ransom price without definitely applying it. Page 568. I would like to mention in that scripture where it says, Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit. In Vine's expository dictionary, if it's used as a noun, the word commit should be deposit. So we read, Father, into thy hands I deposit my spirit. I consider to be a, this to be a classic paragraph. This is from Reprint 4638. 
We will consider another text. You were bought with a price. This text similarly speaks not of the world, but of the church. It is the ye class that were bought, and even they were not bought when Jesus died at Calvary. There indeed he committed to the Father's hands a price, sufficient for all, but it was not then appropriate for anybody, not even for us, not until the resurrection and ascension when he appeared in the presence of God for us. Then we were bought. Ye were bought with the precious blood of Christ. His blood was made the offset so far as believers are concerned. Next, we'd like to consider the veil. Splitting the veil. This would be God's miracle. You will notice on this picture that the veil is split from the top to bottom. From the top to bottom. And this would show that mankind would have access to God. So once God accepted the blood, mankind would have access to God. In Matthew 27, verse 50 and 51, we read, And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. And behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook and the rocks were split. And Mark chapter 50, verses 37 to 38, And Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed, breathed his last. And the veil of the temple was torn into from the top to the bottom. Luke 23, verses 45 and 46. And the sun being obscured, and the veil of the temple was torn in two. And Jesus, crying out with a loud voice, said, Father, into thy hands I commit, and I would put the word deposit, my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last. And for a note, the veil of the temple was approximately 60 feet long, 30 feet wide, and approximately uh, four inches thick. Some say three to five, but it was very, very thick. God's great miracle. The tearing of the veil at the moment of his Jesus' death dramatically symbolized that his sacrifice, the shedding of his own blood, was accepted as an atonement for the sin of Adam. It signified that now the way of the Holy of Holies was open to God. The age of animal sacrifices was over. And this was confirmed in Daniel chapter 9, verses 24 to 27, that when Jesus would offer up his life, all animal sacrifices would cease. And this hope we have as an anchor of the soul, a hope both sure and steadfast, and one which enters within the veil. God's great miracle. One of the mighty miracles of God was the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The evidence that it took place was not weak, but powerful. There were more than 500 witnesses to testify that it took place. So the key events that we'd like to summarize one, Jesus died on the cross. Two, God, justice, accepts the blood of Jesus as a deposit. Three, God miraculously splits the 60-foot veil from the top to the bottom. Four, God miraculously raises Jesus from the dead. Five, Jesus makes a draw from the deposit in 40 days for the church class. I would like to repeat five to make sure this is what I think is the correct view. Jesus makes a draw from the deposit in 40 days for the church class. The gospel age is the grace covenant. It would be the beginning of the Sarah feature of the Abrahamic covenant. In Galatians chapter 4, verse 26, we read, 
But Jerusalem above is free. She, Sarah, is our mother. Galatians 4.31 So then, brethren, we are not children of a bondswoman, but of a free woman, Sarah. The millennial age will be the age of free grace. In Revelation 22.17 we read, And the spirit of the bride say, Come. And let the one who hears say, come. And let the one who is thirsty come. And let the one who wishes take the water of life without cost. Now, we realize it's without cost from the standpoint that Jesus had to die. So we understand that it's without cost to us. But Jesus had to pay the price. And this scripture is on the wall in the Pacific uh, Garden Mission in Chicago. Jesus dies on a dead tree. Galatians chapter 3 verse 13. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a dead tree. Rivers and trees of life in Revelation 22 chapters 1 and 2. And he showed me a river of the water of life, clear as crystal, coming from the throne of God and of the Lamb. And in the middle of its street and on either side of the river was the tree of life, bearing twelve kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. This I believe to be one of the most important scriptures that we have as Bible students. It would be my wish that you either memorize the scripture, underline the scripture, or put a big star by the scripture. Do something with the scripture so that you would remember it. I'm going to add the words that apply to the scripture. Because he, Jehovah, has fixed a day a thousand years in which he, Jehovah, will judge the world in righteousness through a man, Christ and the church, whom he, Jehovah, has appointed, having furnished proof to all men by raising him, Jesus, from the dead. On our chart, you will notice that Jesus is the Lord of the Sabbath. Jesus will be a prophet, Priest, King, Mediator, Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, and Prince of Peace. The most remarkable thing of all these titles are, if we prove faithful, we will share with the Master as being joint heirs. So my admission, admonition for myself and for everyone Do not let anything interfere with your conscience.